Thanks, Jim. All right, so if you're in the right place, uh, this is a session uh, for Cisco Unified Communications single sign-on for developers. Um, we're going to look at quite a bit of code. Uh, I know this screen uh, isn't exactly huge if you're in the back row. Uh, there's some glare on it. Uh, so uh, I am signed into a WebEx session. Um, so everything I'm showing on my desktop is available uh, at this WebEx uh, address and, and meeting number. If you have your laptop or an iPad, uh, you can go, go ahead and join this WebEx session and get a nice close look uh, at what I'm doing on screen. Um, might might uh, uh, make it more visible for you. So is anyone planning on actually doing that? If not, I'll, okay, I'll give you a second. Awesome. So uh, if you happen to uh, be here this weekend, uh, DevNet put on a really cool hackathon, 24 hours of, uh, of uh, intense coding. Um, my colleague, Mike Moss, did a great job of, uh, of leading that. Um, but the primary focus was on uh, IoT, Internet of Things, and you know, uh, um, Enterprise uh, of Things and the Enterprise. Uh, Cisco, and rightly so, uh, uh, this uh, 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 Cisco Live especially is very excited uh, about the Internet of Things. Um, now, I've uh, been a uh, developer evangelist uh, in the collaboration space, in the Cisco UC space, uh, for almost 14 years now with Cisco, working for developers. Uh, and I have to admit that my favorite things to uh, talk to on the Internet uh, are people. So uh, we're talking about collaboration here. Um, uh, collaboration is all about people talking to other people. Uh, people have identities. Uh, people have to uh, be authenticated. They have to be authorized to use uh, services on the network, like call control, uh, like WebEx, uh, like uh, Jab uh, Jabber Chat. Um, all the various uh, Cisco collaboration technologies, they're all secure, which means that uh, everybody has to log in at some point in time. Uh, and so with all those network services out there, uh, all the APIs that can access those uh, network services, um, there's uh, a real, uh, a lot of grumpy users uh, that uh, have to log, log in repeatedly for multiple ap applications, multiple times during the day, um, and uh, uh, they're not happy about it. So uh, a lot of smart folks in Cisco uh, and elsewhere around the world and the internet got together uh, and they spent uh, a large number of years and time and came up with uh, a number of uh, architectures and design paradigms, um, uh, standardized uh, data exchange formats, uh, protocols, et cetera, that uh, loosely um, can be referred to uh, as single sign-on. Uh, so uh, everyone uh, can understand the, the concept single sign-on uh, in everyone's mind, especially the users and the, and the CTOs. It looks something like this, you know, very easy. Uh, the, I, I, the identity service is in the cloud or on the network somewhere. All the applications simply connect to it and, and users log in, uh, and it's all uh, sweet and easiness. Um, the reality, if you're an application developer, especially if you have an existing application that uh, collects, you know, usernames and passwords and you're used to using that, um, the reality for developers of trying to uh, incorporate single sign-on support into your app uh, is that it's not quite that easy. So um, in, in case you're interested, uh, I thought in the remaining minutes of this presentation um, that we might talk about one of the small components uh, of OAuth 2 and, and SAML, which are the technologies that uh, make up the UC uh, single sign-on experience. So here we go. Uh, stop me if you have any, have any questions. This is one component of that technology. This is just SAML now, so if you have any questions about SAML, let me know. I'm halfway through here. <laughs> so my point is there's a lot to know. Uh, this is just one component. OAuth 2 has documentation that equally uh, dense. Um, there are uh, an infinite number of options 
you can tell that many large committees got together. Uh, everyone had their say, and everyone uh, got a piece of, uh, of the pie. Uh, as an application developer, and when I first started learning about this and trying to document it for our partners, it was really pretty daunting. Um, I'm sure that uh, you can go and get PhDs in, uh, in this kind of technology um, and spend years studying it. Um, um, that, wasn't, that wasn't cool. Uh, I went to some of the uh, application developers uh, within Cisco that were using this technology, asked for their help, boiled it down a little bit, boiled it down further, uh, looked at some example code that they gave me, um, went back to these documents several times, and over the course of a couple weeks, um, at least for Cisco UC, uh, communications manager and things that use OAuth 2 and SAML, um, I boiled it down to basically this call flow. So especially if you have a, a call manager application, a Unity connection application, um, uh, a WebEx application, this is the basic call flow. Still not simple. I mean, that doesn't look like uh, 10 lines of code to implement uh, at all. Um, I'm not going to take you through this call flow. Go read the docs if you want to. I'm going to show you how to do this in a couple dozen lines of code at most. What uh, I want you to take away from this slide, though, are the pieces of the puzzle. Uh, you will need to be aware of them. So obviously, there's the user. Uh, uh, so uh, the user interacts, of course, with a browser. Uh, so we're talking about single sign-on situations that uh, have a browser login component. Um, the uh, actual use case I'm going to show you is a web-based application uh, that's going to use uh, browser-based uh, single sign-on uh, for the implementation. Uh, so in the middle, I do have a mouse. In the middle of this web server is your application. Uh, so this is a web app in the example I'm going to show here. Um, and uh, this is you. You're, you're going to write some code to handle SSO here. The new piece of the puzzle is the authorization server. Uh, so this is what's sometimes known as the identity provider. Uh, this could be Active Directory. Uh, Active Directory can function as an identity provider. Uh, or it could be something in the cloud like Ping Federate, uh, another popular uh, single sign-on source. The other uh, and last component is the resource server. Uh, this is just an obscure name for the actual service, the API that you want to reach out to and get data from. So in this example, uh, uh, that resource is going to be uh, Cisco Unity Connection, uh, a voicemail server. So let's take uh, a look at some code. What I'm going to show you uh, is basically uh, two major steps. In the first step, uh, we're going to use single sign-on uh, to go talk to all those security servers, log the user in, and at the end of all that song and dance, what we want is a token, just a string. Um, it's uh, an authentication token. And we will use this uh, uh, instead of username and password uh, to access APIs on the Unity Connection server. So that's step one. Step two uh, is very, very similar to what you're doing already. Uh, you're going to use the APIs that you've been uh, uh, using on Unity Connection, UDS, uh, WebEx. Uh, except uh, instead of having to collect and manage and, uh, and be uh, in charge of the username and password, all you're going to use is this token, and I'll show you quickly how to do that. All right, <clears throat> so this is uh, my index page. This is the main application. Uh, this is, uh, you know, if you can imagine this very, very simple uh, uh, interface here, uh, could be uh, salesforce.com. It could be a very complex uh, line of business uh, web application uh, that wants to uh, incorporate some uh, collaboration features. For example, in this case, we want to know how many voicemail messages we have, so we want to use that API. Um, this is, uh, I, I boiled this down to about as simple as you could possibly make this application. Um, it's not very pretty, but it's pretty easy to understand, I think. Um, actually, this is the wrong page. We need the index. There we go. So we're going to start off well, with only two pieces of information that your application needs to know uh, to support single sign-on uh, from your customer. So you need the location of Unity Connection in this case. And uh, I better connect to my VPN because that's where my servers are. OK. The other piece of information that you're going to need uh, during this initial step of getting the token uh, is a oops, is a redirect URL. Redirect URL, and we'll talk about that uh, in, in just a second. So let's take a look at the actual source code of that page. 
Um, it really couldn't be simpler. Uh, up at the top we have um, uh, our HTML, uh, very simple stuff, um, just some buttons, uh, uh, a text box that we're going to put the output in. When we finally get the token at the end of the, uh, uh, the procedure, we're going to spit it out and show it, show it to the user dynamically. Uh, the heavy lifting, as it were, uh, happens in JavaScript. Uh, so when uh, the user clicks on the submit button, uh, so this button right here, we're going to do uh, basically two main steps. We're going to create uh, a request. Uh, this is going to be a URL that reaches out to the Unity Connection uh, Authorize API. Now we're going to give it uh, some special per, uh, parameters. Uh, some of them are just magic. Uh, they won't need to ever change. You don't need to discover them. Uh, all you need to, to, do, to do is hard code them in, at least for right now. Uh, there are two dynamic pieces of information that you will need. One, very simply, is which voicemail server you want to talk to. Uh, and the other is the redirect URL uh, that I talked about earlier. So that's coming from this. That's going to be configured uh, by the system administrator uh, of the Unity connection. And basically, uh, you'll see it, it authorizes our application uh, to use this authent authentication API. So uh, uh, in these lines of code here, uh, we're simply building that URL. Um, it ends up being pretty long. Uh, there's a magic client ID. Uh, this is used for all third-party applications, so you can go ahead and hard code that. Um, uh, the scope is always uh, unified communications read-write. Uh, the response type is always token. Uh, so this is almost a hard-coded uh, string that kicks off the process. So what we're going to do uh, with this URL is uh, open a pop-up window. So we're going to put the login session in a little pop-up window for the user to use. Uh, we're going to display uh, authorizing in that pop-up window. And then we're going to give it the URL. So we're going to launch that pop-up window towards all the security infrastructure. And we're going to let it go. So it's going to do all its thing. Uh, it's going to give the user uh, you know, a way to enter a username and password. It may, it may show a Ping Federate logo. It may show some, uh, an, an AD logo. Uh, who knows what that looks like? Anything could happen in there. Uh, that little browser window is going to go all over the place. It's going to go to Unity Connection. It's going to go to uh, the AD server. Um, it's going to come back. It's going to go back out again. None of that you need to worry about. All you need to worry about is what happens at the very end of the process when the token is ready for you. So what happens uh, when we uh, launch this pop-up window is that at the end of the process, the user's browser will be redirected to the redirect URL, which is right here. Now I'm going to go ahead and implement that as uh, another uh, web page on my local site here. Uh, so it's called uh, SSO uh, callback.html. Um, and uh, at the end of all this process, that's where I want uh, the user's browser, browser to land. So app.example.com. SSO callback.html. So this is it. This is SSO callback.html. Uh, when the user logs in, uh, this page will be the very last thing that loads. Uh, as soon as it loads on the window on load event, um, the, uh, this little piece of JavaScript is going to run uh, that's going to grab the hash. Uh, so the token is provided as a URL fragment, uh, otherwise known as a hash. It's going to provide this in a JavaScript function back to the parent page. So if we look on the main page, here's that parent callback function. It's JavaScript that's running on the parent page. It's receiving uh, a call from the child window. Now, normally, it's difficult or impossible uh, to make this kind of cross-page or, or cross-page uh, a JavaScript function, but because there's a parent-child relationship, uh, that's allowed. Uh, so uh, again, this is the main application page that's going to get a callback uh, from that little piece of, of, uh, of uh, JavaScript. We're basically just going to parse the access token, uh, and we're going to display it to the, user, to the user in the token field right here. So let's see if it works. I've entered in the location of uh, the Unity Connection. Uh, Got to get that right. 10.5 uh, voicemail server. Uh, this is the Udirect URL where I'm going to be listening uh, for that response. 
authorizing. All right, so this is the very, very simple UI for the user to log in. Uh, notice that uh, my application never sees the username, never sees the password at all. So we're not uh, susceptible to any security uh, breaches from that. Go ahead and log in. All these connections are secure. Uh, one of the implementation details when you get on site with uh, customers is you will need to know how to import certificates, uh, do secure connections in your code. Um, all right, and we can see that at the end of the process, uh, that pop-up window, um, just like we told it to, uh, the SSO callback HTML loaded very quickly, uh, put the token into the parent page with JavaScript, uh, and then uh, immediately closed. So uh, you only see just a flicker of that. And the result is that the uh, SSO token that we requested uh, is available to the application. Normally, you wouldn't show that to the user. That would be kept in a local variable. Um, uh, you could use it on some subsequent API requests. Uh, and that's what I'm going to show you next. Uh, so uh, the second page, and this could be uh, another page in the application. Uh, this could be an entirely different application. Um, that is going to rely on the single sign-on uh, fact that the user logged in with this application. Uh, in this web application, uh, the uh, single sign-on process will re immediately result in this token uh, uh, for cookies. Um, so this page, basically, we're going to... Uh, that's not what I want. We're going to use the SS token that we just got in the previous step, and we're going to make an API call to Unity Connection and ask it how many voicemail messages I have uh, in the background in JavaScript, and then we're going to dynamically populate that value into the web page down in the response, uh, basically add some XML. So let's look at the source code of this page. Again, maybe a couple dozen lines of code. Um, uh, very, very simple. Uh, most of it, or at least a good part of it, is uh, the, HT the HTML uh, for displaying all this stuff. Um, again, there's two important pieces, uh, response or request uh, and response. How do we make the, re the, the correct uh, request to Unity Connection? And then what do we do with the response when it sends the uh, answer back to us? So if you've uh, been around since the Web 2.0 days, uh, and you've made uh, and developed web applications, uh, then you are very familiar with the XML HTTP request uh, method. Uh, this is the, the, the magic sauce between uh, that, uh, the magic sauce of uh, Web 2.0 that allows a web page uh, in JavaScript to dynamically make requests to other sites or the same site, uh, get some data, uh, and then using uh, the, the, the DOM methods of modern browsers, populate that uh, dynamically without having to re refresh the page or go to another page or anything like that. Uh, so HTTP, XML HTTP request is what we're going to use. Um, we're going to build a request. Uh, in this case, uh, it's going to be a GET request. We're going to be reading, requesting some information from Unity Connection. We're going to need the location of that, uh, which was uh, entered into this field over here. We are going to uh, ask for this particular API in the REST uh, API space for uh, Unity Connection that tells us information about the messages uh, in our inbox. Um, we are going to pass uh, to this API request the SSO token that we got uh, in the previous step uh, that I showed you a few minutes ago. So that's the login. That can, that's, uh, contains the compressed username and password, essentially. Uh, the, the special thing that we need to do is uh, add uh, an HTTP header to this request. We're going to use the authorization header, which you're probably familiar with, but instead of basic auth, we're going to use bearer auth authentication. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, other authentication modes associated with OAuth2 and SAML. We're going to uh, use the token that we gave it, um, and at that point, the request is ready to go. Uh, so the final thing that we need to do uh, when uh, we make the request is handle the answer when it gets back. Uh, that's pretty easy to do because the uh, XML HTTP object has uh, a set of events uh, that we can listen to in the JavaScript. 
Uh, so as that object is making requests, it's getting redirected to the identity provider, it's getting redirected to uh, Unity Connection, it's coming back to the browser, it's doing a post. Uh, as it does all that stuff to collect uh, uh, the security uh, authentication and permissions, um, you're, you're getting events. The one combination that we're looking for at the very end of the sequence is a ready state of four, which means complete, uh, and a status of 200. So 200 OK means that, uh, that everything's cool and copacetic. So at that point, uh, we have a pretty good idea that uh, the sequence is complete. Uh, we can go to the XML uh, HTTP object. We can grab uh, the XML object off of it, turn it into a string using some JavaScript, uh, and then stuff that string of XML uh, into the response uh, uh, part of the web page. Uh, so that's this, this box right here. We should see the actual XML request. All right, so uh, we've set up the request, we've set up the response handler. Uh, really all that's left to do uh, is do the send. So that's the very last thing that happens when you click on the submit button. So let's uh, see if this will actually work. We have uh, the SSO token that we got from the previous step. Uh, we have the location of the voicemail server that we want to query. <laughs> I like it when a plan comes together. This is the uh, actual API request that we wanted. Uh, it tells me basically I have essentially zero messages in my inbox. So very simple. Um, again, I would like to uh, emphasize that uh, this is uh, a really compressed uh, it's pretty much the simplest uh, possible example I could make. Uh, but the good news is if you're uh, in a unified communication environment, uh, we really do things one way. Um, that means you, you know what to expect. You can hard code many of these values. You know uh, how it works. You know what configurations to request from your customer. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, looking, taking a look at this example, uh, you know, putting some correct error handling and things like that in it, it will be uh, pretty easy for you to say, I can support single sign-on uh, with my UC application that you already have, customer, when they're ready to migrate. Uh, and uh, that means that the users don't have to log in multiple times or log into multiple applications. They're going to be using your application more. And that's always good. So there's a few minutes left. Um, is, if, does anybody have any questions uh, right now over, over what I've covered? Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh. That's a good question. Uh, so the question is on what versions of Communications Manager is single sign-on supported? Uh, so, so support has started in 10.5. Uh, so there are, there are uh, a handful of APIs. Uh, UDS is one of them. Uh, Unity Connection uh, for voicemail is one. Uh, JTAPI, TAPI, WebDialer, uh, things like WebEx. Uh, Spark also uses this form of authentication. Uh, so when Spark APIs come around, what you've learned here hopefully will be applicable. Um, uh, uh, if you'll notice, all these are typically user-facing APIs. Uh, so they're APIs that would uh, tend to be consumed in a mobile device uh, or a browser-based application that the user interacts with. So uh, like I said, these are users uh, with their usernames and passwords, and they get lazy and tired of typing them in, uh, which is where we're focusing our single sign-on support right now. Right, so uh, the question is, uh, does the Axel API support single sign-on? Uh, and the answer uh, is no, uh, because it's, not, it's definitely not a user-facing API. Uh, you don't write, want to write a web application that lets uh, end users log in and start uh, uh, reading and writing directly from your database. Uh, the Axel API really should only be used by a server-to-server -server type solution. Now you can you know, proxy a web, a web page on top of that, uh, make sure you're abstracting that API from the user, you don't want to embed actual Axel uh, you know, access into a web browser that, that could be anywhere in a coffee shop, right? OK. Uh, so I think I have, how much time do I have left, Jim? Five minutes, cool. Um, like I said, I, it took me a while to get my arms around this. It took me a while to boil this down. Um, uh, there's a lot of troubleshooting. There's multiple moving pieces. Uh, there's uh, three or four different servers involved. They make different hops. Uh, there's different credentials. All the settings have to be exactly right on the back end. Um, and again, uh, as an application developer, you generally don't have to worry about that. 
because uh, the, the uh, uh, Cisco TAC will help the, the customer set up the SSO environment, and then you can just come in um, and uh, basically you don't have to do anything. You just pass the request through, and all that stuff on the back end handles it. But uh, I did need to do a lot of troubleshooting. Um, and uh, uh, being a long-time web developer, you know, web, uh, Wireshark uh, was my friend. Uh, the old F12 button uh, is, is, is your good friend for finding out what pagers are being requested, what errors are occurring. Uh, you can look in your JavaScript console. Uh, but there are a couple situations uh, when troubleshooting um, uh, this kind of solution uh, that, that uh, are difficult to catch in the browser. Uh, for example, that pop-up window. When it first loads, it starts doing its thing. All that happens extremely rapidly on the network. Um, different files are being requested, different security uh, certificates are being exchanged. Uh, you don't have time to hit the F12 button. Uh, it just goes away before you can do anything. So if there's an error occurring in there, it's very difficult to see what it is just by using the, the in-browser tools. Um, so uh, uh, many of you that have uh, developed secure applications uh, know that it can be a pain uh, to look into HTTPS messages uh, to find out what's going on. Um, and uh, the answer uh, is usually what's called a man-in-the-middle tool. Uh, so if you develop on Windows, uh, uh, the go-to tool is Fiddler, a uh, great tool for Windows. Basically what you do is you insert that between uh, the, the, the web browser and the application. Web browser makes a call to the ma this man-in-the-middle application. Uh, the man-in-the-middle application has a fake certificate uh, that you have the browser go ahead and accept anyway, and it basically proxies the requests uh, to the actual secure service. Uh, the point is that that man in the middle has uh, both the certificates and can decrypt the messaging going both ways. So you have a little peephole into the uh, secure messaging, uh, HTTP messaging that's going on there, uh, which means you can debug that just as easily as you could uh, a non-secure HTTP uh, web application. So um, uh, on this laptop, this is all open source software. Uh, it's running uh, the latest version of uh, Ubuntu desktop. Uh, uh, Apache is my local web server that I'm using to host the application. Uh, one of the things that uh, is missing is a, is a nice GUI um, man-in-the-middle tool like Fiddler. Uh, so there is a mono version, and it kind of works, but I found it to be not very stable. Um, uh, it's because Fiddler works on .NET. Uh, there's one real nice tool called Charles Proxy, uh, which has a, had a 30-day trial, um, and it, uh, it, uh, it ran out on me. And I, I was about to plunk down the credit card for 50 bucks last night at 2 a.m. because I, I, ran, I ran out of my license. And I was like, you know what? This is supposed to be all open source. That's my goal. I'm not going to go buy paid software. Uh, so I, I went and found what you're supposed to use <laughs> as an open source developer. Uh, and that's, um, uh, at least in this case, I found uh, uh, a project called uh, Man in the Middle Proxy. So just like Fiddler, if you're familiar with that, uh, this is an application uh, that acts uh, as a proxy server, as an HTTP proxy on my local machine. Uh, so it's going to redirect all my browser requests to itself. It's going to decrypt the information that's sent over HTTPS, and then it's going to uh, proxy the communications back and forth, um, and it will be vi visible here. So let's take, oops, let's take a look at uh, what this application looks like briefly. And then I'll close. Let's go ahead and re request this information again using our same SSO token. OK. So um, we just inserted a man in the middle proxy. Uh, so that means uh, the man in the middle proxy has a fake certificate we want to go ahead and accept. So we can get this working. OK. So we accepted the fake certificate. So the man in the mix middle proxy uh, was able to see our request, uh, sent it off to the Unity Connection server securely, uh, and then brought us back the information. But the point is that we can see uh, the HTTP information, uh, let me make this a little bigger, in clear text. Uh, so you can see exactly uh, what the web request was, what the headers were, uh, tab over and look at the response. Um, you can see that um, uh, the initial response is, um, is uh, the page. Uh, this was, I guess this just loaded the page. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a nice tool that I found uh, free and open source, uh, very easy to script. Uh, so you can, uh, like I have here on the desktop, just create a shortcut to it. 
uh, with exactly the settings and filters and everything uh, ready to go uh, so that I can uh, troubleshoot just my uh, secure application that I want to develop and all the other junk that's running on my uh, uh, laptop doesn't get visible here. So anyway, I thought that was a cool tool. Uh, it's called MITM Proxy. Uh, definitely helpful for uh, secure uh, application development. So probably one minute for questions if anyone has any. Otherwise, I'll, I'll let you guys go. Cool. Thank you very much. Technical Cody, hopefully uh, that's interesting to you. Uh, if you like this kind of content, let us know in the feedback and hopefully we'll have more of it. And uh, don't forget to scan your code for points, free hats, and t shirts. Take care. Thanks, Jim.